Hail, hail, and welcome to the Homeboys Extra. Uh, this Homeboys Extra is uh, it's one that we have we've talked about doing for for considerably long time. I think it's been brought up by several of us uh, several different times for several different reasons, and we thought now, now would be the time to make good on it. We've kind of talked the past few weeks and uh, about it. And one of the one of the things that we've <laughs> talked about and we've decided to go ahead and do this. Like we've talked about it for a while. We decided to go ahead and actually just just jump into it. And it's about the stigma attached to mental health or anxiety or depression or all, all those all those things that uh, that uh, that are you know kind of hidden in society a bit. You know, and kind of veiled behind a, a stigma of be it either shame or embarrassment. So we thought we'd just go ahead and talk about uh, our understanding of these problems, our experiences with these problems, and uh, you know, for anybody out there that's looking for help or looking for assistance or isn't sure where to turn. So we thought we, we, we have a platform to talk about these things, and we thought now is the time to go ahead and do it. I think one of the things that has pr- prompted us to do this now, and I, and I know it's not necessarily football related, would be like the death of Robin Williams, because I think that's something that was pretty stunning to everybody. That a guy like him uh, suffered so badly from depression and, and and took his own life. But obviously, there are football related, uh, you know, associations. There's obviously the Neil Lennon Association, even up to Rob, Ronnie Dyla talking about himself. Uh, Justin Fashion, you know, tragic cases like that. Gary Speed, you know, and all these things, you know, they they all link together. And it's 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 a, it's a it's a disease and it's a problem that uh, it doesn't discriminate no matter who you are, where you are in society. So we're going to we're going to jump into it. We're going to talk about it. So things make it heavy and. Uh, a bit uh, emotional, but uh, hopefully this can be of help to some people. So I'm joined by the usual cohorts, Paul Largan. Hello. How are you doing, Paul? Very well, thank you. And uh, Jason Higgins. Hello. Jason, there you go. Uh, you're back from, back, back from America, things are good? Yeah. Absolutely. Great time, great time with the family, fantastic. And That's the memory now. <laughs> and David Harper, of course. All right. Right. So here we go. Uh, this is a difficult one. To, this is a difficult subject to uh, to address because normally on this show we just ramble and then sometimes have a laugh and whatever. So this one, because it's a serious subject, we're going to need to find a way into the subject and so we can ex- explore our personal experiences and what have you. So in terms of mental health, I think it's probably best for us all to even have a little, a little chat about our understanding of mental health before we all had personal experiences. And I'd be the first to start off and say... Like my understanding of mental health, I would have been one of those guys years ago who was completely ignorant to it, and not only ignorant, also quite, you know, vocal about like anybody who told me they were they were depressed, or they were down, and this was happening. I'd be very much a kind of dismissive person about it. I'd have been like, uh, you know, just put a smile in your face and cheer up. But then it wasn't until sort of going through later life that I realised how serious a problem it is, and how serious a problem it is for me and you know people around me. Uh, so. I've had a massive learning curve in terms of dealing with mental health, understanding mental health, and having to come to terms with my own experiences. Um, but I mean, I don't know about the rest of you. I mean, we, we, we didn't want to make this completely like a depression sort of uh, episode. We wanted to make it just about mental health. So, I mean, the rest of you, like, before you had personal experiences, I mean, someone like Paul, for instance, what, what, like, did you have an understanding of mental health? Before that? Um, no, really, Joe, to be honest. Um, I was very sort of ignorant towards it, particularly in terms of depression and anxiety, where I would just assume that depression meant you were pissed off and anxiety meant you were panicking about something and that was it and you'd be able to get over it, you know? Um, and realised as I got older that um, certain people around me you know, growing up and stuff, were clearly suffering with aspects of mental health problems, yet there was no real support and there was no real kind of understanding for anybody around them, and they must have been going through absolute hell, you know, knowing what I know now and experiencing what I've experienced since, that um, there was a huge stigma attached, you know. There was a definite kind of reluctancy people to actually say, you know what, I'm actually struggling here. Mm-hmm. And I still think that happens now, and I think that is because... There can be still the wee kind of sort of smirking and people kind of laughing behind their back and all oh, watching, blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I think one of the things that um, sort of with celebrities coming out and talking about it and suffering it and, and stuff like that, it's, it's really opened the eyes of the world to see, like as you said right in the intro there, it's, it's no discriminatory and it can affect anybody. And I think that in my own experience here has made me understand it a lot better. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, and it, it, it is a thing where if you see like big celebrities suffering with it, like, I mean, that does open a lot of eyes. I mean, as, as, and whether or not you, you find celebrity shallow or not, I don't, I, don't, I don't really care. But I mean, when someone like we say, if someone like Robin Williams came out and they found that he, he killed himself with computer depression, it's just not me for sex. People think to themselves, well, if he can suffer, I can suffer and anybody can suffer. And uh, it does open the eyes. Harper, I mean, you, you've stressed that you didn't necessarily have suffered like with depression uh, per se. But I mean, uh, your understanding of mental health before you've had experiences with it, I mean, would you be the same, sort of the same as us, just kind of like kind of dismissive and not really willing to look at it seriously? Um, I don't know about no looking seriously because uh, I mean, anybody who listens to this, who knows me, who knows the people who I associated with when I was younger, and that we, myself, and my friends, have lost quite a, a large number of friends to suicide. Uh, seven, three of them who'd be really close friends like that. Mm. So we've never, we've never been anything that I would ever took lightly, even for a relatively young age, like talking about late teens, early twenties. But I think it's something that nobody will ever understand unless they've been through. Mm-hmm. There's, there's until my issues, which will come on, obviously uh, struck me. There was absolutely no way I could have any understanding of what anybody's going through. Absolutely no way I could understand it. And it's completely, <clears throat> what's happened to me has completely changed the way I look at lots of things in life with other people. Mm-hmm. Judging people, I was terrible for being uh, somebody who could make snap judgments a lot of times. And uh, it's, it's completely changed the way I look at things to even just somebody homeless in the street. Mm-hmm. Things like that, whereas before I mean, I just thought I'd junk it. Do you know what I mean? At least uh, all these sort of things completely change when something affects you. Um, so, as I say, I, I don't think I would have ever had even having lost two of my best mates, I'm talking about proper best mates, not just acquaintances. Uh, I think I knew how serious it was then. Uh, the people I'm talking about took, took their lives for, for different things. Uh, obviously, you know, things were very, very unhappy in their lives, but uh, I, I never understood. I was probably a lot of people get angry, mm-hmm. and I was very angry with them. And I just wish that they, they could have come and spoke to you or spoke to somebody. But, um, I, I just, what I'm trying to say is, I never had, even although I was close to people, and I, I never had any, even close to understanding what it felt like yeah. until it happens to you. And it is one of those things that if, if, I, I'm lucky enough. I didn't lose. I've lost friends. I've never lost any friends to to uh, depression, as far as I know. But if uh, even when that happens, I mean, if someone's it, it can lock a person in, you know, and they, well, all the best world in the world. Sometimes you can't you can't even get through that because as an outsider, you don't understand exactly what's going on. You just you just know that some things aren't right with that person. But they can until they come out the other side. Uh, you can never really understand like, if they come out the other side, you know. Joe, that's the thing, right? See, like, the, 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 I'm not going to mention any names, but anybody who knows me, as I say, who listens to this, I know two of the guys that I'm talking about. And uh, for the outside looking in, these were two really outgrown characters who you would not have any inkling that there was something bad in their lives uh, destroying them. Yeah. So it wasn't even like you, know, you could have stepped in and said, look, come on, let's go and talk this sort of, sort of thing. It's just, you, you just don't know. What I'm trying to say is you just do not know. You yeah. do not know. And it's I mean, obviously sometimes, obviously sometimes you do not know. What I'm trying to say is anybody could be suffering at any time. Yeah, and it's not a simple solution. It's, a, it, 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 it's very much a process of the mind and with the spirit to kind of get through that. But we're, mm-hmm. we're going to get on, on that in a second. Uh, Jason, uh, yourself, I mean, like before, have you had sort of any sort of contact or experience with, you know, mental health or depression or, or any of those things? I mean, would you have been aware of, like, the, 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 the sort of the weight of the of the problem for, for people dealing with it? Uh, <clears throat> not at all, no, not really. And, and even getting on to what Harper said there, I still really don't, because... Well, obviously, got on it, but I've not really suffered for anything, so I still don't have a first hand understand. I can obviously support it, seeing it happening in front of my eyes, uh, but I've never suffered from it, so I don't really know. 
you know what I mean? And I, and I kind of agree with what Harper says. I think until you've suffered with it, you don't really know. You haven't got any like, answers and you've not had to fight that long fight and that process of getting yourself better or getting yourself to a place where you can kind of deal with it. I've seen it happening and I've sort of helped. And obviously, I've gone to my wife. I'll he- I help my wife through some of a horrendous time in her life. But uh, all I could do was support her, but I was totally helpless. And I didn't have... Uh, a great understanding and to this day I still don't have a great understanding because it's never really happened to me and I think I agree with what Harper says I think something has got to happen to you for you to fully understand it you can obviously look for the outside looking in you can support it and you can see symptoms and stuff like that but uh, going on to Harper's point with the suicide I've lost uh, some real good friends not all like my best friends, but some real good acquaintances and good brothers and my mates and stuff like that. And uh, for the outside looking in, they were the happiest guys going about, you know. And it's mm. that it never occurred to me at all, you know. And it's just, it's years ago I'd have been like the pull yourself together brigade, mm. you know. What I mean, I'd have been like just oh, give yourself a shake. And years ago I would have thought like suicide if someone commits suicide is selfish. Mm. You know, I still don't. I still don't go with the the, the man for that. It's a very brave thing to do. I don't think it's a very brave thing to do. But the people that do it, they they've reached rock bottom. You know, they 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 don't think they've got anybody else to turn. So that must be how they do it. I don't fully uh, comprehend it in my head why they take that turn. Because as I say, I've not been in that dark place. And but for the grace of God, you know, I hope I never have to be in that dark place. But you never know what's around the corner. But I just think. Uh, the people that take their own life they have just reached the point of no return and whatever is going wrong within their brains if it's a chemical imbalance or whatever that is the way out and it's the way for them to feel better so I certainly do not judge you know I do not judge at all but obviously we'll go on to my story in the time but I kind of feel like I'm playing a wee bit of gooseberry here you know because I've not really had first hand experiences but I mean, I've had first-hand experience obviously supporting my loved one, but I've never had suffered it from myself, so I can't speak for a point of like knowledge. Yeah, well, I understand, but it's, 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 I, think, I think it's the point of this is for me to cover as many angles as possible. Cause, right. I mean, I can't. Well, going to my story, I was just saying, we'll, we'll, we'll kick off somebody's story here. But like, I, was, I, I can't really get a sense of what my wife has had to go through. You know, I mean, obviously, I can. Like, it's things that I can think back and remember and go, "Fucking hell!" But you know. I, I, I just don't know whether she can understand what was going on and I really can't understand what she went through so there's there's, those, there's that balancing act that, that I think we can kind of get into as well like you know that, like you mentioned support support is such a big thing but and then again if you're dealing with someone who has depression or has uh, mental health issues support can be a very testing uh, experience you know yeah because you really got to be it you got to be that person and for as long as it takes and the, you're going to get frustrated and you're going to get pissed off and things are going to blow up because that's you know just just the human nature um but we're going to get down to that so in terms of so I mean, like all of us kind of were of the of the same sort of briefing i suppose before we came into contact with mental health and depression anxiety whatever and we, we were all didn't have a full understanding uh, of, of what what it is and what it can do and on, on the issue of suicide I mean, it's just that same old you know I don't know who said that quote you know suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem you know uh, so it's 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 a tough one for us to really understand but we're going, we're going to give it a go because it's worth it so who would like to uh, open up the, uh, the the discussion about I mean well, first so, Joel okay. yes. uh, I, I, kind of, I, I kind of want to say that when I, I first floated this idea with Paul just over a year ago, mm-hmm. uh, and the reason I felt uh, that I could go to Paul with before anybody else and was because Paul had been quite open, obviously, in the past in his books and speaking the, on the Beyond the Waves podcast. Very mm-hmm. open. And, uh, so I thought, well, if there's somebody who understands where I'm coming from straight away, it's going to be him. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of it for me was I needed to talk to somebody who went through something similar. Uh, and I also, for me, the, the idea of doing a podcast was uh, two, two, two and a half thousand people download this podcast roughly, right? 
And if this podcast helps one person, I mean that, I'm not, this just sounds a cliche, but I swear to God, when I was lying in the utter depths of despair that night, thinking about the podcast and stuff like that, and I thought, if I could do this podcast with Paul, and then obviously you would come in and start talking about stuff as well, but I thought, if I could help one person to stop them feeling how I feel right now, I'll make everybody worth it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. So yeah. That's, that's how it started off for me about the podcast. And I'm not trying to say that this is all about trying to be, a, I don't know, it was to help me as well. Uh, I discussed it. I was in therapy, seeing a therapist. Uh, I was going for CBT treatment. I can't remember exactly what CBT stands for, but I eventually uh, went for CBT treatment. Um, <clears throat> after avoiding it for a very long time and I actually discussed this obviously I bring about my life it was discussed in this podcast obviously come up and I discussed doing a show about it with my I'll just, I'll just call it a therapist for better work and he thought it was a good idea because he thought it would be good for me as well as trying to help others so I'm not just saying I'm doing this for myself as well I'm, I'm not going to shy away from that like no it's about helping other people but it's also to help me as well isn't it yeah absolutely uh so where do we start here um lenny harp you've already kind of opened it up there talking about that i mean i i know from speaking to you like i mean that you suffered uh pretty badly when uh you were out of work as well for a long time there well i'm gonna i'm gonna but i'll just sort of go first if you like All right, mm-hmm. no problem, uh, what, what happened to me was about two and a half, three years ago, when I, I wasn't working for 11 months. And uh, living in Ireland, you're away from your friends and your family. And you, you make friends here, obviously, but it's not the same. So it was like, personally, it was like being in jail. Uh, so I can imagine being in jail, sitting at home every day, skin. Too much time in your hands, too much time to think. And for somebody like me, who's an overthinker anyway, that's bad. Uh, but it was actually ill health that, this is going to sound bad, but I'll explain, I'll explain the story, but it was ill health that I didn't know of it, that how I discovered or what brought on my anxiety. What happened was uh, I was I would go out, just say in a supermarket up the street, and then I'd start taking dizzy turns and just completely panicking. Just the walls closing in, I would just I would just leave a shopping trolley in the middle of the supermarket and run. And I mean like half jog, walk fast, just to get home, I had to get home all the time. And it got to the point where it was like I, I kinda of had social anxiety disorder in the fact that I didn't want to be within any further than ten minutes walk away from my from my house. Because uh, the only place I felt safe was uh, when I was at home. Uh, because then nobody would be able to see me having whatever was happening to me. So I'm the kind of person then that was all this was happening and I didn't know why it was happening, so automatically started to think, well, there must be something physically wrong with me, like, no. Um, I put it off, put it off, put it off, as men tend to do. I didn't know why to go and see a doctor because I didn't know what to be told. But there was something wrong with me. You know what I mean? It's the old one that, uh, I can't remember that Irish comedian with American accent. But he, but he eventually found a testicular cancer. He found a lump in his testicle. I guess, he thought, oh, if I didn't touch that again, I'll go, I'll, I'll, I'll not have it. Do you know what I mean? And I was kind of like that about Des Bishop. I was kind of like that about going to the doctor, but I got to the point where I, I felt like I was just, I was having a nervous breakdown. Uh, what I presume maybe a nervous breakdown was, I don't know. So I forced myself to go to the doctors and... Uh, just basically broke down on the doctors and says, oh, it could be a number of things, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we'll do a full blood screen first. So they says, it'll take about a week for the results to come back. Within two days, I had a phone call from the doctors telling me I had to come and see the doctor straight away that day. So, I mean, automatically, I had myself dead and buried like that. I mean, it's, mm. there has to be something terrible. There has to be something terrible. And they wouldn't tell me over the phone. So my wife happened to be going to see the nurse about someone this, that afternoon, just be coincidence. So I says, I'll come up with her in a couple of hours. They said, you don't need an appointment. <laughs> just come straight in. All that kind of sort of language just made it worse, like, you know, in my head. But 
and I was sitting in the waiting room and uh, my wife went to go to the nurse and I heard the nurse say to my wife, uh, maybe you want to wait and go to the doctors with him. And I was like, oh my God, this is this is just getting worse. I says, no, just go, I'll just go on myself. Like, so cut a long story short, I went to the doctor and she says, look, bit of bad news. She says, uh, you're type 2 diabetic. And I gave it a big sigh of relief, which puzzled the doctor. And I says, well, she says, you're not supposed to be happy with that serious condition. I says, well, to be honest, I thought I was getting worried the way you were talking about know. So I automatically thought, well, that's it. I'm diabetic. That's what's been my problem. I'm going to start taking the medication for diabetes, and it's all going to go away. And everything's going to go back to normal. I'm going to go back to being an outgrown person that I've always been. Confident, all that kind of thing. But I never, it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse to the stage where <clears throat> I wasn't going to leave the house at all. And uh, <clears throat> eventually, um, there was. Eventually, I had to go back to the daughter and, and just say, look, this. This isn't, this, isn't, this isn't just diabetes here, like it's, it's something worse. And what I've basically found out since that the diabetes, I was having hypos without knowing I was having hypos. So suddenly then I was having panic attacks because there was something happened to me that I didn't understand. And my brain uh, registered whenever I did have a hypo that I was having massive anxiety, right? Uh, subconsciously. If you understand what I'm saying, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't. I I kind of sort of sometimes knew I was having a high pop, just no blood sugar, but my brain automatically it gets these sort of chemical signals. Oh no, this is something terrible. This is something terrible, and then it's total panic attack. And this was happening to me every day. I couldn't. I couldn't. Quite, I couldn't leave the house. So I went to the doctor's. doctors. Uh, my usual doctor was in the hallway. I seen this other guy who knew nothing about my past or my history, nothing else, and he gave me pills for depression. <clears throat> um, I've never been suicidal in my life, but that weekend when I was on that course of pills, and I mean it was automatic, it was the, the darkest I'd ever been. I, I, uh, I, I never left my bedroom for like three days uh, because I thought, I've just got to stay in my bed and talk to the back to the doctors because this is just, it was, I can't describe it, just pure, utter hell. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, this, this must be how my mates felt just before then. This, this, this must be, this is, must be how it was. Because you start thinking, is this, is this, is this me for the rest of my life? Is this me dropping down? Is this me? I mean, people who end up mental asylums. This is how this is how you start thinking. People who end up mental asylums will be one they always mental for choice of better words. Is this me? Is this what's happened to me? Is this this, this me? I'm broken. This is what I'm going to do this life. And of course, their thoughts just need to more panic, more panic. Uh, so that was a bad weekend. I mean, bad. So I go back to the doctors on the, the Monday. One doctor was back. And I told her that she's took me off them straight away. She says, right, forget them. They are notorious for making you worse before you get better. Her mum of this was explained to me. Then I was put on someone else. Because I, I never felt depressed at any time. I never felt I was depressed. I felt still happy. I was only anxiety. It's, I mean, to describe anxiety means to be claustrophobic everywhere. Even in a wide open space, it's total claustrophobic. That's the best way I can describe it. So they put me on pills, and I'm still on them, called uh, Lyrica. Uh, they were actually designed for uh, epilepsy. So they found in a lot of doses they were really good for anxiety. And all it basically does is stop certain signals going to the brain that causes anxiety. I mean, it doesn't block everything out, but it's pretty good. And actually, an interesting thing is that the doctor told me, and my doctor studied in Scotland, she told me I wouldn't be able to get these drugs in Britain because they're too expensive for the NHS. I could only get them in Ireland because, of course, in Ireland you have to pay for the doctor and you have to pay for your prescription. So that's one thing. So uh, <clears throat> I was on there for a while. Uh, I managed to get a job. 
started to feel like I was getting better, reduced the pills, but something still wasn't right. I just, I just can't eat. get rid of it. And then you start to think this isn't getting better and it starts to go downhill again, downhill. And now, to, Paul doesn't know this, but uh, there was one, one day I was standing at the bus stop in sobs, or I had been in there Saturday over to you, and it was around about the time Paul had uh, just booked the last pedal diver, <clears throat> and he was doing a series of podcasts with Graham, remember Paul? Eh? Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, if you, can you remember the inscription in the front of the book? For yeah, those, yeah, for those who suffer front. every, aye, for those who suffer every second, every minute, every day. For all those who suffer every minute, of every day, of every year, comma, don't let go. And uh, you see, I had been uh, thinking the book for Paul, editing the book, uh, mm-hmm. when he was talking about it, and when he said it, and I was listening to the podcast, uh, I burst into tears standing in the bus yard because I thought, well, that's, this is fucking me. This is me that he's talking about. This is me, that description, the, the don't let go bit after the corner is very important. Because you stay, you do start to think you're letting go because you just think, how, how, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? It's, it's not there, like, there is no, you're just in a fucking tunnel. Mm-hmm. So that's when I decided that, well, that's it, I need to go and pay for, for therapy, like, you know, I need to go and speak about this proper to someone. Um, and that's, that's what I did. The following day, I made an appointment. The, the following Monday, anyway, I made an appointment to, to a local place here in Drogheda. I mean, everything's private. There's, there's no national health here, as you know. 50 quid a session at cost me, and it was very much how I pictured it would be. I don't know if anybody's watched The Sopranos. Mm-hmm. It was very much like Tony Soprano sitting talking to his, uh, his therapist, and that's... I done that for seven weeks, uh, and it was actually the last week I went was before we went to New York last year, Jason. Because if I hadn't went to those seven weeks, I would not have got my airplane to New York. I can tell you that right now. Mm. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, I've been a lot better since then. Every day is for me is still a battle. Mm-hmm. My diabetes is a big problem because, as I say, my mind, is, my, my brain is still rewired for the hypo feelings bringing on anxiety. And I still get days where I just feel I've got to get away from the situation. Uh, I don't go anywhere near as often as I used to. Uh, so the biggest worry is that it's never going to change. And that, a fact, this is, I, I kind of accept that this probably is where I'm going to be the rest of my life. But definitely hiding it makes it a hundred times worse. Uh, and CBT is not for everybody. I mean, I've read loads of stuff on this and some people just doesn't work for them. But to go and just talk to someone who, and you'll be amazed the stuff that you'll start Talk about. Mm. One of the main things that I've always tried to hide my anxiety is that because I was always such an outgoing, central of the room kind of guy that I didn't want people to know that I'm less than who I was. Because that's how you feel. You feel that you've lost a bit of you mm. and you're not a person anymore. So definitely talking about it and not hiding it. And I say that, but I still hide it. Hardly anybody knows about this. Mm. But confiding in the people. Yes. Uh, well, I know that's why I've been very nervous with this. That's why it took a year to me first mention it to Harmon, because I still, even the night, I was kind of shaking before I even went on. I was still very mm. unsure about laying all this out there for people. Mm. Um, there's some of my good friends still don't know anything about it. Uh, but what I'm going to say to anybody is if you're, if you're listening to this and you're fucking hiding under the, the duvet like I used to do, I used to have to lie. I was, I 
was, I was downloading the Linden method and all these different things about try to try to put myself in a trance and everything just to stop panic attacks. You know, I had to get in my bed. That was any time I had to, I had to get in my bed. No matter what, I had to get to my bed. No would tell you everything would then be all right. But if there's anybody, Elias, or please, if there's anybody listening to this and you're going through anything like that, just go to your doctor first, right? And explain doctors are all better than you think they're going to be, especially in this day and age. And they'll help and find somebody else that you really, really trust and you can talk to that you will be willing to open up property. Because half hearted, just tell half the story to see how people that don't know what you've got to you've got to go smooth with to all it. Mm. And it definitely helps. Definitely helps. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's where I kind of am at the minute. I still feel that I'm in a fight every day not to have a panic attack. I still try and avoid a lot of situations. But I'm getting better. I went to New York there in April and one. Uh, and I had a great holiday, but it also one of the worst holidays I've ever had because I spent a lot of time wandering over New York just in utter fear that I was so far away from home and so far away from my bed that if anything went wrong, that what would I do? No, it was going to go wrong. I mean, it's, it's terrible, wasn't it? It sounds completely stupid. As I say, you'll never know how it feels until you experience it. But the biggest fear is fear itself. Mm. I think it's probably a good description. But that's kind of where I am now. I'll maybe pop back in my stuff. But... Well, like I say, I mean, like the, the, the failure to, to you know, deal with it and the, the, the sort of, especially for men anyway, I mean, like the, uh, the uh, initial reaction to hate it. I mean, it's, you, you, it's, it's a thing you can't hide. I mean, it will eventually consume you. Uh, and, and, and by just hiding it, you're just kicking the problem down the road, and therefore it's going to snowball and get bigger. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. So, I, can't, I have to reiterate, Paul, I mean, uh, how much you speaking about your stuff helped me. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I'm not just saying that. I'm not blowing smoke at your ass, because I wouldn't, I'm not yeah. a kind of person. I wouldn't do that. And I'm sure it's helped other people, but it definitely was the spot for me to to go and seek that kind of professional help past my doctor. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I'm hoping that this, what we are going to do tonight, what we are doing tonight, it helps one person, it's worth it. Do you, see, can I just come in there yeah. a wee bit? See, 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 Paul, yourself, how obviously you were very public about it, and mm-hmm. saying it in podcasts and stuff like that. Did you get loads of people coming up to you and telling you that they'd had similar experiences? Yeah, um... I thought that. Uh, yeah, I have had a lot. I mean, obviously, some people use it as a stick, you know, but then you experience that anyway. So, but I did have a lot of people privately say things like, I know what you're going through, or, you know what, that's what I've been going through. And it does. I mean, I was probably somebody that would never have shared that until I actually spoke to a psychiatrist who did say that that every time you tell your story, every time you mention it, every time you write it down, it's a cathartic process and you psychologically unburden yourself for it. And I urge everybody to do that because it definitely works. Yeah. And see, see my, my story from my wife, uh, see when she sort of got over her fear and started speaking about it, she couldn't believe the amount of people that were saying, oh, I've had that, I've had that. Mm. And she, her story is very similar to Harper's. It's more panic attacks rather than, we put it down to kind of postnatal depression, but uh, it was more like panic attacks and stuff like that, just exactly the way Harper uh, is describing it. But when she opened up, because obviously I wasn't going to tell anybody, it's up to her, you know, I don't want to go out. I would speak to my confidence and say about this and that, and then I would get, maybe a couple of my mates would come down and they would speak to her, and I was, I was trying anything. But once she got the courage up and then she realised, oh, there's nothing wrong with me, I've nothing to be ashamed of here, and she started talking about it, she could not believe the amount of people that came forward that had mm-hmm. similar, uh, similar experiences. And she's very one that, see if I know anybody that's suffered with a similar thing like that, she's like, give them my phone number, tell them to give me a phone. Because I'm more than happy to talk to mm-hmm. them, you know, and give them my experience. Because she's, I think she's, I mean, she's over 
the worst of it, but she still obviously has her wee moments and stuff like that. And it's just something she's got to learn to live with. But she's more than happy to speak. And, and that was the thing, I was a bit dodgy about coming on here because it's not me I'm speaking about and I feel a bit awkward, you know, speaking about someone else. But uh, she was more than happy for me to come on and sort of tell the story. But really. So I just thought I'd ask that. One, one of you thing I'm just putting that uh, I should have probably mentioned that, that there was one day in my work where I was taking my pills in my back pocket and I dropped them and the guy went beside me he says, hey, what's that you got there? I says, oh no, it's nothing bad no. he says, oh, let me see you he says, what? he says, what's, what's that? he says, liquor I says, I hope you want he says, he pulled it he had the exact same pills in his back pocket okay. so it just shows you I mean, I honestly believe now if I'm in a room with 10 people Probably half the room are experiencing some sort of mm. issue. Uh, I, would, uh, I would kind of agree there. Uh, it's unbelievable the amount of people, the amount of my friends, because obviously the new got Linda went through the amount of my friends that have come through to me and said to me, you know, I've been suffering for that. And I'm like, what? And it's like best mates, and I had no idea, and they would never have mentioned it until Linda sort of started speaking about it, and I started speaking about it in the old. Jason, I mean, you, you're not self-minded. Um, I, I didn't go on it so much as I would. I know you didn't actually either, but you, you know yourself, any time that a thread about this came up, the amount of people who would be calling on it that are in the same boat, they're always some of the busiest threads on the boat. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know I've got about 100 personal messages saved for folk on there when I tell them Linda's story? I mean... Do you want me to go just now and sort of give one the story and then oh. you can, because I'm sort of kind of talking about it now, how do you want to do this? I want me to carry on. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, kind of started, me and Linda have been together for years and uh, we get married in 2000 and everyone was just happy days, you know, just loving life and going on holidays and doing our stuff and Linda's never been into the football or anything like that so I'd take her to the odd European away trip and things like that so that I could get to more games <laughs> and stuff but she's never interested in football or anything like that so that was me sort of doing my thing with the boys and she would go mm. and do girly things and stuff so she, she's still not interested in football at all this might be the only podcast that I've done that she'll ever listen to <laughs> but uh, it was I can always remember it was uh, her first child Ellie was born and it was a Saturday night and I was up and uh, I was up in the pub uh, with a few of my mates and I'd been to the football and I was just getting a couple of pints and obviously the wean was born and stuff so my curtailed my nights and stuff like that so I was in getting a couple of pints and it was the lottery get drawn around about uh, was it half seven or whatever and the phone goes in the pub and my wife would, would never phone the pub for me tell me to come home or anything like that, right? She, no, they don't. She wouldn't do anything like that. And it was angry before mobile phones and stuff. So the phone goes and the big barman, big Johnny gets the phone. He's like, Jason, the phone for you. Yeah. She's like, it's the phone and it's her. She's like, eh, can you please come home? I was like, what is it? She's like, can you please come home? And I was like, why? She's like, just come home, I need to see you. And I'm like, everyone's going through. Do you know, actually, I thought we'd won the lottery. You know, I'm saying to myself, we've won this in lottery. You know, I'm going down the road, and I was getting, I, I had no idea what I was going home for. And then I went in, and she was and she's seen her lying in a heap, and she was like shaking and shivering and stuff like that. And I was like, that's it. And she just kind of burst out crying and told me she's been, she doesn't know, and she's feeling terrified and all this kind of stuff, and totally like shaking. And I was like, bloody hell, are you all right? And I did a few pints, so you're like, what did I do? I phoned my mum. first thing I always do is phone my mum. She'll know what to do. But, uh, I, I, so basically we just cuddled each other all night, stuff like that, and I think we all got away in the morning. And I kind of, she, she was kind of embarrassed after that, and it was like, but then there was a wee bit of a pattern, but see, to be fair, it didn't really come to much. It didn't really, we, we went away to Amsterdam, there were another couple of couples, and it was one night we were at, and she's like, I need to go back to the hotel. And went back to the hotel and I sat in and she's like, I just don't feel like you're out. So it sort of spiralled a wee bit for there, but it didn't really get anywhere. And it kind of, we kind of forgot about it. It was just like a wee thing that that happened. And she was, as far as I was concerned, she was all right. So Ella got a wee bit older and stuff like that. And then she fell pregnant again. So then her son was born and life was great. Everyone was. <laughs> I kind of forgot about all that stuff that happened because it, it didn't really go on for any length of time for me 
But obviously she'd now been hiding it in herself. But she actually, we've spoken about it since, and she says she kind of got out of it, so that was a bit. So then uh, Rory was born, and it was maybe about six months after he was born, and then it started again. It was like she used to come in, in fact, it was about a year after he's born, when she went back to work. She used to come in for work, and every night she came in for work, she went straight up the stairs and went into bed. And I'd be sitting down the stairs, I'd be getting the tea ready for my kids and stuff like that, and uh, then I'd go up and be, you all right? I'm fine, I'm just a bit tired. And that, that's all it was, and it was a like total denial. And then I used to see she'd been crying and stuff like that. So it was like, what is it? She used to wake up in the middle of the night and burst out crying and stuff, and it was like... Pfft. Absolutely heartbreaking. I'm like, what do I do here? You know, and it was like, so, but we still kept going on about her life. She kept, still kept going to work and stuff like that. And she'd just like hide it for folk at her work. And uh, I'll never forget this. This is when I posted it on Celtic Minded. Uh, Celtic were playing AC Milan and uh, in the San Siro. So uh, I'd booked up uh, and we were heading out. My, my mate Johnny that comes on the show, Johnny was gone with me and uh, our two brother, my two brothers and my mates and uh, we picked up my minibus to go to Glasgow Airport and uh, gave her a wee kiss it was like three in the morning or something like that, out in the minibus and uh, um, we were a mile and a half for the house and a wee text came through please he's come home and I was like ah oh, fuck you know and like, this selfish bit inside you like I wish I didn't have a mobile phone <laughs> you know because I could go to Milan and enjoying myself so I was like ah, you're joking so I just said to my mates there I said I'll need to go home they're like what I was like there's no way I said I'll need to go home so the minibus turned around took me back up the road and they were in and she was lying in a heap at the front door howling like, I'm so sorry I'm so sorry and all that and she was just like a wee kid you know and I was like bloody hell so it was just like so that moment I said right we need to fix this we need to get this done so I went to I went to work. There was a, a woman, the project manager, I worked with Eileen, I'll be forever in my debt. Uh, I went in to work, work and it was a few days later. And she's like, Are you all right, son? I was like, nah, No, no, really. I said, Have you got a minute? So I went into a meeting room and I said to her, I said, Look, it's my wife. She says, Go new, go home. She says, Take a week's holiday. She says, I'll worry about getting you holidays for it and stuff like that. She says, you take a week's holiday, go and look after your wife. So I always, she always be forever in my debt for that. So I went home and I said, right, we're going to get this fixed. So the company I worked for at the time, they had, uh, they had counsellors. So I says, right, you're going to get a counsellor. Oh, no, no, I'm not. She's like, I'm not, I'm not getting one. I'm like, no, yeah. And Linda was always the opinion. She wanted a wee pill for the doctor just to make her better. You know, it was like, I don't want to put any hard work in. I don't. I just want to feel better, which is only natural. Yeah, everybody wants to feel better. So I'm like, right, I'll organise this. I'll get everything done. So it gets to the council, uh, get an appointment a day later or whatever. And uh, I end up going for this Chinese therapy, trying everything. And uh, just a full week, we, and she's like, you need to be honest with me, you need to be whatever. So she did, she went to the council and she came out and she said it was traumatic, she hated it. So I phoned up and I says, look, that counsellor was rubbish. She says, we'll get you another one. So I got another one. And she still to this day says, that counsellor sort of changed her life. And it was like the Sopranos, like, you going about half or a bit like that, you know, just sitting there, bearing her soul and telling the counsellor everything. Obviously, I wasn't in the sessions with her. She's had to do it herself. But even after then, she still was like, not really doing much to make herself better. And we, co- we sort of plodded along see for the next year or year and a bit we plodded along we got by we had wee nights out we, we I always remember we went to London we went to a good restaurant in London and at the end of it she's like I need to get back to the hotel and there was all stuff like that she had to get to her bed just exactly what you say to her she had to get to the safety of me and her in a room just the two years and she felt safe and there was all that kind of stuff and I was like Phew. so see a year a year and a bit went by and I must admit, I was at the I ended up getting at breaking point, you know, because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't get for a pint. I couldn't. And that seems very selfish when your wife's going through that. But I can only live my life. I can't live my wife's life, you know. So I'm telling her, you need to do this. You need to do that. I had mates in trying to help her. Mates that were good with Reiki therapy or things like that. Positive thinking. I'm getting tapes. Try to get everything. Cause I'm saying, right. And do you know what? It was a. Uh, 
about a year and a half later, and I'm not advocating that other people do this, right? Because I say, I think I done no bad for a year and a half. But it was one time uh, she went to bed again or something. And I says, what are you doing? And she's went to bed and I says, so I just had enough. And I says, Linda, I'm not doing this anymore. She's like, what? I says, I'm not doing it anymore. I says, I've been running after your ass for a year and a half. And I've been skipping about this. I says, see if we draw AC Milan in the European Cup and I've booked up and you text me now, come home, I'm not coming home. She's like, what? She's looky for you. And I says, unless you start helping yourself and unless you start, I see you making a positive impact in your life by doing stuff, I'm not coming home. And she did. And see, for that day on, she started exercising, she started doing whatever. And she always says that was basically the kick up the ass that she needed. And I'm no advocating that's the because that was a long road, that was a year and a half before it came to that, but it came to like a breaking point that I had to say, like, I need to see you doing something here rather than just curling up my ball and going to bed. And she did. And I take my heart after her and you know, she's fought it and she's she's back in the mean because she was off work for months, you know, and just like curling up in bed and like just that safety aspect and see now what a difference to our relationship, our life, and it's just there is light at the end of the tunnel, you know, but it's a lot, a lot of hard work. And she now goes out running and she's she looks after herself, she goes on diets and just things that keep her sort of mind occupied. But she still has the odd dark day, you know, and there's still as we we things that happen in life and stuff like that. And I'm not saying we are living in a utopian paradise, but it's really good and it's I'm dead proud of her, do you know what I mean? And she's like mm-hmm. she's honestly fought through hell to get where she is today. Because as as you say, Harper, I can support it and I can well obviously I can only support it for a year and a half. But I don't mean that I probably would have still come home. But I just felt that I had to do something. My my tact at the time wasn't working. So I was like, at the end of the day if she'd text me again, I probably would have come home, do you know what I mean? But I just got to breaking point and I had to kinda of make a stand and get her to sort of do something. She just always wanted, like, a, an antidepressant pill to make her better. You know, that she hadn't to do anything else herself. It just that pill was going to fix her. And she she took pills um, for a while, and she's now totally come off them. You know, she weaned herself off. First of all, she stopped taking them because she was feeling better, and that sent her back months, because now you need to wean yourself yeah. off these things. So, uh, but now she's totally, uh, she's been away from them for maybe about a year now, and or maybe more than a year, I don't know, the time's flying by, but that year and a half or two years of our life seems like an absolute distant memory. But the, the one thing that always comes through was she felt guilty because she had the perfect life. You know, she had two great kids, she had a lover, a husband, she had a family run about her a support network, we lived in a cracking house, the kids were doing well, and like, she's like, uh, she felt guilty for why do I feel like this? You know, but you don't make yourself feel like that because obviously she's the nicest person I've ever known in my life. And it's like, you, she didn't make herself feel like that. It just happened to her. And yeah. she just had to work her way through it. And it was the, the hardest fight she's ever fought. But I'm so proud of that she got there. And uh, that's kind of my story. And that's the, the story for like, as I say, I still don't fully appreciate it because I've never suffered for it. But I've seen it, and I've seen it when it does to the person I love more than anything. And it's like it's absolutely heartbreaking. So I just I would urge everybody there if a few partners going through that, support them as much as you can, but help them and sort of urge them to talk about it. But she's more than happy to talk about it to anybody now. And I've got and I've actually said to loads of folk, well, my wife will give you a call. But going back onto the Celtic minded thing, eh, when I I put a post on that day when I come back for the. Uh, <clears throat> come back for, on the way into the airport and I must have got about 100 PMs for folk that had because obviously there were thousands of folk on that and I always uh, I kept them and I read them out to Linda and you've no idea of the comfort that I gave her that other people have been in that position and there is light at the end of the tunnel and you have me alone and there's always help for you there and the one thing I would urge for anybody is just talk to somebody about it talk to anybody about it yeah. just pick somebody and it's the uh, and do you know my 
priority list now. You've got a kind of priority list with all your friends and stuff like that. And it's folk that they're my best friends. It's the wee thing inside your own head, you know. You've got best friends and you've got acquaintances and stuff like that. There was actually folk that I probably didn't have much time for. But they're the ones that came to the front and I found that they're the real decent folk, you know what I mean? And they would go out theirself to help you and then they would bend over backwards to try and make sure you're all right because they sort of suffer for it themselves and they understand it. And I, mean, I just thank a lot of them. I mean, once, uh, there is a feeling that once you've kind of cracked that egg of getting get, getting your mouth open and getting your sort of feelings out in, out in the open, that you do find people kind of not, not necessarily gather around you, but they'll have, they'll have a story of what, a personal story of something they've encountered or sort of one of their families encountered. Right. And everybody's got a kind yeah. of. And I suppose, like, as as a partner of a person who suffers, like, you've got to be. It's got to be incredibly frustrating for you as well, because you you feel so helpless. Not only do they feel helpless, but you feel helpless too. Mm-hmm. And I suppose, as a partner and, of somebody, you're rummaging around looking for any solution possible. You know. And, and see, see, see the thing as well. Well, obviously, I was reading up everything about it, which you probably have yourself had. Mm-hmm. But the thing that comes across is panic attacks are not real. Do you know what I mean? They're, they, they are doing you no physical harm, although you yeah. think you're dying at the time, but yeah. nothing is actually happening to you. It's all in your mind. But that's yeah. all right saying it's all in your mind. Just fix it. You can't, because your mind's controlling the way you're thinking and then it's spiralling out of control. But there is no, like, you're not doing, your body is not causing your body any physical damage. It's just your mind is going crazy. You know, and that's the, that's the thing that's hard for me to get my head around. How can that happen? But obviously, your mind's the most delicate thing. Uh, and if that goes, that goes, you know. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Another thing that a lot of that put you to say, Linda, is mirrors what's happened here with, with me and Vicky. Obviously, Vicky playing your role. Uh, she probably had the added... Uh, thing, uh, I was I would drink, I was drink heavily. Because uh, alcohol definitely masks it. Definitely, you know, alcohol is a depressant. It still masks it. It definitely, mm. definitely masks it and makes you feel better at the time. The and that's guy. that's why I I have a complete different outlook now. And when I hear about people who are having alcohol problems and drug problems and stuff like that, are they, are they, is it because of some of like us? And I can completely understand it. Because I would, I, when I wasn't working that time, I would drink every night just to feel, because it's all the times I felt better. Mm. And even if yeah. I had to go somewhere, I would force, I would, if I, had to, if I had to go to the pub for something, I would drink, I would drink four pints of a half an hour. Mm. Because that, because I knew then that I would be, I could be all right if I drank four pints mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. I could be all right then. Yeah. And that's obviously a, a downward spiral as well, that can only go so far as I mean, the next day is ten times worse than this day. Yeah, I, I, so, I think it's worse. Yeah. You just make it worse. So, I mean, Paul, you've you, obviously we, 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 you, publicly you've come out, I mean, obviously in podcasts, but obviously we want to you know, separate this podcast for what, it, for what, what it's particularly about. So, I mean, your experiences with, with mental health, I mean, like, mm-hmm. where, where do you think that started for you? Well, I mean, anybody kind of knows me or knew me, you know, when I was a young guy, 17, 18, I was, I was the life and soul of parties. I was at 18th birthday parties and 21st birthday parties. I was always the first guy on the dance floor. Come on, let's go. Let's get up and all that kind of thing. And I was always confident. I was always outgoing. I was always that guy. Nothing ever embarrassed me. Nothing ever got me doing, you know. Um, but as I got older... Um, I started to notice changes in myself and, and that I had to, I, I guess, perform that role. People expected it, so I performed that role and it tired me. And then I would say by about January 2003, something inside me was ripping me to pieces and I just couldn't figure out what it was. And, of course, if you remember, that was exactly when Celtic were on the UEFA Cup run um, towards Seville. And I was was going to the games, you know, uh, in various countries, Stuttgart or Liverpool or whatever, but it was becoming hard. And I was watching all these people around me in Stuttgart, at Anfield, in Portugal, and that, you know, having the time of their life. And a lot of the things that Harper said was happening to me. I was feeling anxious. I was feeling anxious on planes. I've never been scared of flying, but I hated being on the plane. I hated being in that confined space. And come that summer, I was being torn to pieces. 
And so when I went to the doctor and told the story, the doctor straight away said, you're depressed. And we talked about how, you know, depression was kind of rage turned inward and how it was so tiring to experience it. And um, so I went on to the, the Prozac and, and all that kind of thing. And it you know, did make me feel better, but then it made me feel worse. And so I binned it. I just thought, oh, stuff this, you know what I mean? And just spiralled out of control to the point where um, I couldn't sort of function as a normal person for about two, two and a half years. And my weight went out of control, went up to 22 stone, didn't give a shit, takeaways every night, drinking, smoking, did not care less. And then at one point, I was feeling, about August 2005, I just couldn't, I was feeling dreadful, constantly feeling dreadful to the point where I just I had to go to the doctor, I just didn't feel like living anymore. This is feeling horrendous. And then the doctor got all the checks. Then he said, right, you need to go up to the hospital immediately. It's pretty similar to Harper. So what's the problem? Like, just you need to go up and they'll know. And I'm, all right, so up they go. And boom, all this kind of thing. And the young lady doctor come in, very nice looking girl. I'm kind of looking at her. And the first thing she said to me is, do you enjoy living, do you? And I said, aye, great. And she went, make the best of it, because you'll be dead in five years. I said, what do you mean? She said, the way you're gone, you'll be dead in five years. She says, you're grossly overweight, you're drinking too much, you're smoking too much, etc., 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 unless you change your life. And she gave me the biggest kick up the ass in terms of physical health that I've ever had. To the point for when for August um, 2005 to May 2006, I was 22 stone two, I think, when she weighed me in that hospital that day. And when I on May the 8th 2006, I was 15 stone five, and I just stopped the drinking, stopped the smoking, went into that kind of thing. But what I what I'd put doing my effectively my depression to was I'd had the breakup of a relationship, I'd had various bad things going on in my life. And just thought, well, that's what happens, eh? I mean, you, things in her life happen, you feel sad, you get over it. But I never got over it, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. But but my the flip side of that was my physical health was getting a hell of a lot better. I was feeling much better about myself physically. And this had projected me only going over to New York a lot and eventually moving to New York, which I thought would be, that's it, you know, I'm on my way, boom. Um, but then what happened to me then was May 2007, I remember it. So I've, I've moved to New York in November 06. I've hit the ground running. I've got an apartment in Queens. I've got money coming in. I've got some good friends. I'm having the time of my life in the best city in the world. And I feel like I want to fucking die. I My girlfriend at the time was, what do you want to do? Nothing. No, absolutely nothing. And I've, at that point, I stayed very close to Shea Stadium. Let's get the best seats in the house. Mets are playing, I think it was the Red Sox. No interest in, you know. Well, why don't we go to the theatre? Who are playing at Nassau Coliseum? Do you want to go there? No interest in. And it was this, and it was ripping into me. We ended up going to Washington, D.C. that weekend under the stupid notion that, you know, oh, I can leave the depression behind me and go to Washington, D.C. Doesn't happen. Doesn't matter like that. You just take it with you. And so... I had one choice then, which was to um, go and speak to a shrink. So I was like, right, okay, I'll go and do that. Then what happened was the shrink had sent a message, an email saying, I want to speak to you on the phone about this. And I was like, what? I just couldn't speak to anybody on the phone at that point. I could, I hated it. I absolutely despised it. And I was like, well, fuck you. If you know what to talk to me, you know, talk face to face, I'm not talking to you on the phone. What can kind I of shrink are you, blah, blah, blah. So that for then I spiralled into drugs and uh, was on a three gram a day uh, cocaine habit for about a year, and that was that was me. That was like I would get it, and it was good eight stuff. Well, go at home I'd go and I'd sit there in my chair all night just snorting cocaine all night, all night, all night, all night, all night, all night watching stuff on the telly, and then at the end of that, when this cocaine was done, I was doing three grams a day. Uh, I'd have a joint. And that would be me to sort of calm myself down to go and go to sleep so I could get back up and go and do the same thing again. And that was me continuously. And that was that. And then about, um, I would guess, April 2008, if you would call it the middleman between me and the drugs, um, said to me, you need to get a grip of yourself. Like, and I'm saying, what are you talking about? You know, because I'm feeling invincible. I said, I feel great. And that's like... He's just shoveling that shit up your nose like it's going out of fashion. I said, oh, what do you know? And all that kind of thing. And he says, I'm telling you, it's no good. And uh, you know what? I was like, you know what? Fine. 
And I started to think about it, and I thought, Christ almighty, some of the things I was doing, some of the things I was saying, some of the attitudes that was coming at me, it's just atrocious. But of course, when you're on that course, you didn't give a shit, you know what I mean? You're just like, no, no, get the drugs, take the drugs, go to sleep, repeat, all the time. So, of course, I started to clean myself up, and then, <laughs> and then of course, uh, that was April 2008. Come um, June 2008, I got arrested and, and all that kind of thing. So... So pretty much, you know, uh, from that moment of pure shock because of people didn't didn't remember or people didn't know, when I was arrested, I was set up. I thought I was going to a meeting with somebody, um, and they were setting me up to be arrested, you know. So when I arrived at the place, I'm kind of waiting on the person, and then boom, guns at my head, etc., etc., etc. So went through all that, went to jail, you know, I was in there 31 days, came out and was just doing this course because the, the, the technicality that I'd go out on, which is something called the Vienna Statute, which is effectively uh, something that was brought in after the Second World War, when you when a foreign national is um, arrested in a, in a foreign country, they have to inform the embassy, and the cops never done that. So I was able to go out, but of course the nightmare was still there. In the meantime, I'd lost my house, I'd lost my job, I'd had all my money taken off me, all my credit cards stopped, and literally was having my whole life shut down. So I was living in, you know, just perpetual fear constantly. What was going to happen every single day? Cops follow me. Had to go and stay with a guy. Had to wear an electronic tag. But detectives coming to us every fucking day. I'm putting this guy's family through absolute misery. Who they are, they are being Marines, of course, trying to help me and stuff. But I was just like constant, constant, constant. To the point when I had to go through all this stuff um, and then eventually go, oh, I quitted all the stuff, but then had left the country. And thinking that in that situation, when, when you're in jail and when you're in somebody else's house and when you're going through all this stuff and you feel like you've got the weight of America on top of you, you think, or I thought, that the only way, the way out of this is to get back to Scotland, get back to normality and get this kind of nonsense. Little did I know that that was just the beginning of my problems. So when I get back to Scotland and I've not got a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out, I'm thinking, right, how do I sort of rebuild my life? But I knew that I'd changed. I could feel that I'd changed in that time. And I was in, so I went to my mother's house initially. I was in there three days, knock on the door, and two big burly guys are standing there, uh, um, Mr Larkin, whatever, I said, I just to let you know, we're for um, this crime divisional unit, whatever. I was like, I what's the problem? Like, just to know we're watching you. And off they go. And I'm like, what the fuck? So this kind of went on. And eventually I get my own house. And so I get my own house maybe around the early, late September 2008. And that's when the darkness came and the anxiety came. And at this point, a sort of daily routine for me would be to get up, be scared, have a, almost have a heart attack every time the letters came through the door or somebody came to the door. I'd have bad dreams, I'd have night terrors, I would be very, very, um, only go out if I really had to go out, all this kind of thing. And this went on for two months until the 15th of November 2008, where I just could not take it anymore. And funnily enough, watching The Sopranos on a DVD, there's a scene in it where um, Ralph Cifaretto's having a problem with Tony, and he goes to Johnny Sack, and uh, he basically says, I'm going to kill Tony for this. And Johnny Sack says to him, you want to commit suicide? Pills are a lot easier. And I clicked pause on the DVD and I said, you know what, he's right. And I went out of the house and I walked up to Tesco and Leith Walk <clears throat> and I bought six uh, packets of paracetamol and two bottles of water. And I said, this is it. That, this is the way out. And I took them back. I put them on the kitchen counter. It was a small flat in Buchanan Street in Leith. And the uh, old Victorian house, huge roof, small uh, living room. And I put them on the counter and I sat there and I just thought, right, that's it. That's what I'll do. But on my kitchen wall, just to the left of the sink, was a photograph of my eldest son. And I lay on my couch and I looked at that photograph for about an hour. And I just thought, I can't do this because he's going to have to suffer this for the rest of his life that his father left and wasn't there to bring them up, and wasn't there to do all the things that fathers should do with their kids and stuff like that. And so I'll no do it. And I never done it. 
And the Pulse sat there for ages, still on the counter, uh, and were there until December when my girlfriend from America came over to stay. And she came over on Boxing Day 2008 and, you know, sort of delighted to see her. I hadn't seen her for August, since August, things like that, great. And she said, oh, what, what's the story? What's you got a headache or something? What's the story of the pills? And I was like, oh, well, actually, you know, it's funny you say that, but that was how I was going to kill myself. And she was like, what? What are you talking about? And then, so we go through it. She says, you need to go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor and basically told him the same story that I've just told him here. But he was absolutely aghast. He was like, what on earth are you doing? You need to be getting treated for this. And he was like, you know, are you working? I said, no. Right, well, you need to, you can't do any work. You, you need to you need to get yourself sorted out here. And um, so I was like, fine, no bother. So he put me on this course. At the same time, um, Atos had started and this whole disability thing. And I went through that and that and I speak to anybody who's went through that, that was the closest that I ever came I've ever came in my life to killing anybody, which was the was the so called nurse who treated me that day me, who basically abused me for an hour about pull your cell together, blah blah blah, all that kind of thing. And she went out to get something for me to sign and she went and I thought to myself, I'm gonna fucking kill her. I didn't give a fuck anymore. Who the fuck is she to talk to me like that? But I never done it, and I never, I mean, I could feel the rage burning inside me. I could really feel me snapping, and um, and that was that. Now, the thing about it was, because everything had happened to me in New York, I couldn't think or look or talk about anything to do with New York. It just, I couldn't bear it, because there I was, I had this life, I had the house, I had everything gone for me, and then, bang, it was gone. Just like that. No warning, no bullshit. And also, the reason it was gone was because something unknown to me happened that I didn't um, have any inkling about. So that made me incredibly paranoid. And I didn't want to um, go into confrontations with people. I didn't want to leave people thinking they might be pissed off at me because then they might go and talk to somebody else and again try and ruin my life. That was how I kind of thought. And eventually... I thought, I need to try and do something here, you know. And I went to the cinema. It was the first time in months. And I went to see a film called Righteous Kill, which is with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino playing two cops in New York. And within five minutes on the screen was the police station that I had been taken to when I was arrested. And I just, fuck sake, and out the door. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, out the door, couldn't believe it. So eventually, you know, I started to see shrink and stuff like that. Um... The first thing the shrink, when I told the shrink about that part, he asked me to New York, and he, he said to me, you know, New York never done anything to you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it was people within it. Never, the city never done anything to you. And nobody had ever said that to me. I thought, you know what, you're right. But there was still something hankering. And so a, bit, a year into being back, I made the decision, I, th- I need to go back because I can't have left it like this. It's horrendous. But I was suffering all the time with anxiety and fear and all this kind of thing. I just wasn't myself. And um, But having that kind of focus about going back to New York really did give me that kind of focus on, on something. And so um, when I went back to New York and although it, was, it didn't really work out and various things happened here that made me have to come back, I came back with my own merits and I came back at my kind of behest and I was, I was kind of um, mentally, I was able to kind of face my demons in New York because I was so scared. I mean, I tell you right now, I was so scared to go back to New York that I didn't even fly into New York. I flew into Chicago. And my thought was, well, I'm, I'm in America and that's close. Um, and I remember flying in from Chicago to New York and flying in, no problem. And all of a sudden, as we got to, we came in sort of from uh, the south end when you see Statue of Liberty, Staten Island, things like that. And I said to my, my partner at the time, I said, Jesus Christ, the turbulence is fucking unbelievable. And she looked at me and she said, there's no turbulence. And I was shaking like a leaf because I was coming back, you know, and here, here was, this is my nightmare and I was coming back to it. And it was hard. It was really hard. Um, and so... 
I really had to then stand up and face the demons, and I, it did help. It really did help because nothing sort of bad or anything happened to me in New York. But the pro the issue that I had that had changed me was my tolerance level had had gone, and also my fear had gone. And I remember reading an interview with a boxer on Alec Arthur, where he said that he'd been punched so much that he actually wasn't scared of being punched. And I felt by then, when I was there in New York second time, and when I came back to Scotland, that I'd been scared for so long that I actually wasn't scared of anything anymore, which was a dangerous cocktail. It's Harper touched on my anxiety. That's a dangerous thing to have, because then what would happen, I've got no tolerance for anybody, and I've got no fear of anybody. So you say something I didn't like, I'll rip your fucking head off. And, th and I knew then that that had to change. And that changed through great friends. It, it changed through doing these podcasts and, 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 and all that kind of thing. It changed through writing books and putting the thing down. And when Harper talks about The Last Pearl Diver, what I tried to do in that book was write a story about a guy who was had everything, you know, he was just a happy, good lucky young guy. And through no fault he's in, something happened to him. It changed his character completely. Because I knew, because I'd been there, and I knew I'd, that happened to me. And I wanted to try and say to people, this can happen to you, but you're still the same person. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. It can seem the darkest thing in the world right now, but you can get there. And I got there by talking about it nonstop, by putting myself out there, by exercising, by going for long walks and all that kind of thing. And I can honestly say, I meet people all the time. I met a guy, Scott, yesterday at the, at the Paul McStay game who was just like, oh, you're brilliant on the podcast and all this kind of thing. Four years ago, I couldn't speak to anybody on the phone. Yeah. I would not speak to anybody on the phone, even close friends. It's just completely uncomfortable. And here we are in these issues. And so, as Harper said, and I'd like to reiterate to anybody, and Jason touched on as well, there are, there are, there's, you're, you're not alone. Right. You know, we've all been there. And you can look at me and think, oh, God, look at him. He's no fear. He's up there, you know, standing on a stage, talking at book launches and talking on podcasts. And I used to be fear scared. I used to be terrified, and it used to rip me apart. And what got me back was telling people and bringing myself out myself and going for it. Now, it's not the same for everybody, but I tell you, talking about it halves the problem immediately. And yeah. so that I hope, to, to finish up, I hope that this podcast triggers one thought and one mind that says you're not alone. And listen, and I'll tell you, I'm sure I speak for everybody here on this podcast, see if you feel that you've got nowhere to turn and that there's nowhere to go. Phone us. Uh, get, us get, in, get in touch with us anytime. And any one of these people right here, right now, will speak to you. Because I can honestly tell you that I've spoken to Joe and spoken to Jason and especially spoken to Harper. We have in, um, spoke to each other at length about depression, anxiety, mental health issues, and we've helped each other, yeah. you know? Harper mentioned um, getting on a plane to New York. I hope you didn't mind me saying this, Harper, but I remember an incident last year where you couldn't get on a plane to edit to, to Scotland. Exactly. Um, last last November. Uh, yeah. My mate's 40th, my best mate's 40th. I was turning up as a surprise, and I got as far as the airport, and... Uh, I got off the bus and I was just caked and sweat, frozen. Mm. And it was nothing to do with the fear of the flying or that. It was the mm. fear of there was going to be people at his... And it was only a wee gathering at his mm. And that was actually kind of made it worse because then I was going to have to talk to people mm. and yeah. try and hide this at the same time. And I just says, no, I just can't do it. Yeah. And I went and I went and I got, I got the... I sat for a wait for the next bus to take me home. Mm -hmm. And see, what you said there to me is absolutely paramount. What you were fearing was what you were doing to yourself, which was hiding oh, it. Yeah. That's what the fear is. And that's the whole, all you've got to do is, is, is just never let go, never think there's no point, boom, and that's it. Because there's always a way out and there's always a way back. And people will pull you at it. You know, people, one of the things that used to piss me off was when I was really going through the depths of hell and fear was people would say, aye, he's a phone. You know, any assholes you've got, just he's a phone. Now, I'm sure everybody here knows that's the hardest thing in the world today yeah. when you feel like that. You need, people need to understand 
that if you think your friend or partner or whatever is going through that, you need to be the one that pulls them out. They're not going to date themselves. They can't. It's the hardest thing in the world to put your hands up and say, I'm fucking struggling here. Any, yeah. any, can anybody help me? But I tell you, the minute they do, and you might have to go through hell, because I put people through hell, and I'm sure we've all done it, where people were saying, I'll take you here, I'll do this, I'll do that. You know, and I'm even graphic, sexual things, everything, no interest, no interest, no interest. And I'm sure they must be thinking, oh, you know what, I'm fucking sick of this. But they persevere, and they bring you back, and one day leads into the next, you know what I mean? And it's a circle. It's always a circle, you know, the good times are always around the corner. It's just sometimes you can't see it, but they are there. And as you say, speak to anybody, just speak to somebody. Because the minute you do, and as I said, if you if you recognise it in somebody or you suspect it was somebody, go and speak to them and straight away you'll relieve 50% yeah. of that burden. Absolutely. There's, there's a certain sort of relief mixed with hope that comes in that comes into you after you've sort of flushed it out with somebody even just even just mm. once for 20 minutes you walk away and you think and you do feel a certain stirring in yourself going i mean this this you, you literally just chip the first the first piece of the rock mm. you know what i mean and all, all you gotta do is just keep going you keep keep taking it through it you know well can i can i see, see something you said there about how people would look at you doing like just getting up on stage and <clears throat> obviously doing your your book launches mm. and do the q and a's and People would probably say to me, like, well, you go on and you do the podcast and you seem, you seem out going, you're having a laugh, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. To me, I, I mean, like, I, I would do maybe even just me functions with the Celtic Sports Club and I'll go up the stage and I'll do all the speaking in front of everybody and that. Uh, and to me, that is easy mm-hmm. because that is kind of me acting and being somebody yeah. else. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more fe- I've got more fear after that having to go to the bar and talk to somebody yep 100% everything one on one. I think everything creative is a performance when people see me on a stage or hear us on a podcast we're performing uh-huh. yeah. and it sounds wanky to say that because we're no actors we're that, but that's what we're doing here we're performing yeah. we're talking how we expect people to, to, to hear us you know yeah. what I mean um, that's easy for me, as you say. What's hard is sorting my life out. Yeah. What, what's hard is living day to day. What's hard is confronting things. You know, that's the hard. That's the hard aspect. You know, I've had um, my second marriage was effectively broken down by me going through this, by my low tolerance and by my aggressiveness and by my complete and utter selfishness, and that's the hard part. Put me on a stage tomorrow in front of ten thousand people, no problem. Yeah, I mean, like you, Let's go, go. you can go on a stage with notes and, and structure and yeah. work it out, but there's no notes and structure for your life. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, whatever in government see, they're like we're all performing, and that's I find it easy to perform, but it's the manual day to day stuff that grinds people doing, and that's something that I've always found hard. Yeah. See, see, before you go, Joe, <laughs> just the thing that always brings it back to me is. See, this is this is coming to the point again of not understanding it. So, see, like yourself, Harper, not going on the flight, or Paul, you know, going out and things like that. Mm. Do you, do you think somebody's going to laugh at you or something like that? See, like see, like you were into the thump function and you had up like a mad panic attack and you turned around to three of your pals and says look this is what's happening to me do you think people would laugh at you or what what's the what's the fear you know what's the because because my wife used to be terrified that people at her work would know you know that she'd go to the toilet and people at her work would know that she's in and i'm like but people in your work would help you you know they would be sympathetic and obviously one of them would have been through it themselves and someone but obviously I'm trying to get my head around it. What, what's what's the fear? For me, you know I mean? um, I'm not putting it right. I know exactly. No, I know exactly what you mean. Um, the fear for me is, it's uh, it's not people laughing at me or that because a lot of times for me it'd be, as I said, in a supermarket, they would know me anyway. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Strangers. Aye. But <clears throat> it'd be worse in front of people knew because I would, I didn't want them to. To look, I would. I feel that I don't know what they see me different to how they they thought that. As I spoke about this, my therapist. How did I get this? I was I was always quite. Uh, I wouldn't say a, a hard man, but could look after myself. Shall we say, right? Mm. Uh, I had a, I felt 
probably this is all going to sound really vain and stupid but when I was younger oh, I, probably no, had really a, I probably had a certain reputation um, and you feel that that's the person who I was is who I wanted people to believe who I was again. Mm. I didn't mean to believe I was a hard man like oh, that's coming out wrong I just I didn't want people to suddenly think fuck me what's happened to him mm. that, I, that I'm broken basically and not the fact that they would laugh at me just I didn't want to, people to think less of me and I felt mm. genuinely felt that I was less of a, a man if you like uh, for, for something that mm. uh, I felt very it would make me seem very weak. That's probably yeah. the best way to put it. Uh, it is, because uh, you, you, you don't want to admit to yourself. That there's, like, I suppose for you, you'd be having a panic attack. You're starting there going, like, there's no way I can get away from this. If I run out the mm. door, it's still there. It's still going with me. And there's a frustration that's attached to that. Going, like, and, and, and just inevitably, you turn that upon yourself because you're the one who's apparently in control of what's going on, but yet you have no control of what's going on. So you find mm. yourself in this sort of this sort of war, internal war of like, well, fucking, why can't I, why can't I sort this out? What the fuck is wrong with me? And that's where the weakness sort of comes into your mind. You're like, I'm just fucking, I'm useless and it's shit. And you go in this fucking rabbit hole of, of just, of just negative and shit thinking and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So, you know, it, it's, uh, maybe it's through time and experience that you develop some sort of mechanism to cope with that, you know, but then again, yeah. it's not something you can rely on all the time either because you, you might cope with one panic attack a certain way, try that again another time and, Nothing happens. And, no. and Jason, do you know what? It's not just the fact that people see you or anything like that. It's like, it's even you're saying, like Linda says, I've just got to get home. I've just got to leave now. It's very much yeah. about the only way I'm going to stop having this. And it is a physical feeling, this horrible feeling inside me. The only way that is going to stop is if I get to where I need to be right mm. now to make it better and to me and it seems to be Linda as well was I had to get to my bed and I would have to try and fall asleep because if I fell asleep even for 20 minutes it was like a reset button because yeah. if I woke up to sleep I would wake up sort of all right and it felt like well that's going to give me a couple of hours respite before it all starts again yeah great yeah I mean for me it's slightly different. It would be on a no, no now, but on, a, on occasions, plenty of occasions in the past, it would be if you said, you know, we're going for a night out or at somebody's engagement party, whatever. Do you want to come along? You know, have a few drinks. That would be to me, and the same analogy I would give you is if, if I said to you, do you fancy climbing Ben Nevis tonight? That's yeah. the amount of energy that I'm going to put into this to make you think that I'm not ill, yeah. you know, because I'm going to have to sit there and smile, and nod heads, and laugh. And like Harper said, I mean, I, I've. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention there with Harper mentioned about drinking four pints really quickly. I've seen experience of that with a guy who, who never left his house for four months and his nerves were absolutely sharp. And then eventually we persuaded him to go out and that's exactly what he did. Four pints, doing the neck within about five minutes and he, he felt fine again. And as Harper said, that's not the answer because then you become somebody else and, you know, it's easy to become... You can fool a lot of people a lot of time, but the people you can't fool are your real friends, and it's your real friends that will notice. You know, they'll be the ones that will say you're right and whatever. Because, you know, I've felt all sorts of things of depression, and a lot of them has been rage and anger, and I can feel it burning up inside me and stuff like that. And it's it's horrible because you think you're not in control, wow. and what could happen? You know, I mean, what could happen? You somebody just say something the wrong thing and whatever, and like Harper's, like I saw, you know, I come up, it's, it's a different world now, but I'm brought up in an area where, you know, people didn't say the kind of snidey things that they say on social media to people, because if they did, they were getting a sear face straight after it. Wow. That's how it worked. Then I moved to a place um, in America where people talk straight, you know, People called a spade a spade. And then I come into situations now in my life where people just don't even talk like that. And so I've kind of overbear my personality on them. So you're constantly adjusting yourself. But if you can plant the kind of seeds of your foundation that will, you know, allow you to have bad days, because we all have bad days. We all, you know, a lot of the time people say, oh, somebody close to me has died, I'm depressed. No, you know, you're sad, you know, and we have these feelings. Um, depression is an illness, 
it's no cause, and Christ Almighty, Robin Williams proved this more than anybody. Here's this guy, a comic genius, absolutely loaded, beautiful wife, phenomenal, who's great family, and he's got depression, you know? Now, what did he have to be depressed about? Which is the stupidest thing. John Gregory said to Stan Collymore, what have you got to be depressed about? Yeah. Anybody that suffered that knows there is no answer to that question. It's see, just see, see the other thing as well, with alcohol, just quick, mm. before I let Joe carry on, because... Like, uh, Anxiety is basically fear. It's, mm. it's been in a complete state of terror, like it's fear. Uh, it's fear of fear. It's, uh, it's a feeling, uh, if you know, I mean, everybody's experienced where you have a complete fear of something, right? Just a sudden, you no, know, like uh, that fight, fight or flight feeling, right? And it's like being, a, it's been in, like stuck in that state. But as you mm. know, alcohol, alcohol, uh, breaks down the barriers of fear and, and that's mm. how it works for me it stopped me being it would stop take away that fight that fight or fight feeling which is what I felt permanently in if I had to leave the house for any for any length of time and if you have that alcohol that fear goes away because there's probably some there's probably some sort of chemical thing I imagine that, that stops those sort of thoughts pretty much I think how the lyrical works for me Mm. That's it's it's basically it's it's blocking the fear. Now I'm not saying that means it's it's why it says well go but I'm not scared of anyone. That's that's no that's no it's, it's hard to explain, it's not like that. But alcohol gets rid of and it's not nothing to do with inhibitions or anything like that. As I say, is I'd be pretty confident to go and do the put on the show, put on the act, mm. and it gets rid of the fear and it stops the, the, the things inside your head. And that's that's another thing with alcohol as well, you know. But, yeah. as I say, that's a, that is a vicious circle. Yeah, because I tell you, if you do too much of anything, it, it, it literally rewires your brain. Yeah. If you drink too much, you take too many drugs. They've said that with people who watch too much pornography, people who watch too much violence, whatever, eventually it rewires your brain. And yeah. what, the, what the drugs are doing is stopping that, because, as you say, you live in that... You, you can't live in fear all your life and not be affected by it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I lived in fear, total and abject terrified for three months solid and then so it got post-traumatic stress disorder because of that and you know and yet but because there's no physical you know ailment people didn't sort of think there's anything wrong with you and that is a, is a stigma of mental health i feel jason i mean you know you've you you've spoken about it probably lots of times about how bad my handle was and that's <laughs> that is because Aye. People won't even realise how much drink I'm putting away. I'm probably drinking twice as fast as a lot of people in the room and hiding the fact that I'm, I'm going Aye. to the bar and getting an extra couple of wee halves here and there because of, uh, it feels that as long as I keep drinking, the fear will stay away. Mm. And I think also as well, somebody with type 2 diabetes will tell you uh, alcohol lowers your, your blood sugar. So it also helps me in that and, and that side that if I was high blood sugar, it would drop that, and that would make me feel better as well. But then the next day, it comes back ten things worse because mm-hmm. of the amount of alcohol we've taken, and the, the alcohol, and the sugar in my bloodstream, and that sort of thing. So for me, the diabetes is a is a fucking brucey bonus on it. Like if you know what I mean. But that's that's I think that's how I have these mad, mad, terrible hangovers, and it's just like, uh, but yeah. that's that's the other thing, eh? So. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> right, so I just go with that. Um, I, my, my story, I've kind of only come to the realization. I was going to say conclusion, but there is no conclusion. The realization in the past, maybe even just the past year and a half, two years, about you know, that I've kind of struggled with this my whole life since I was a kid, and I've kind of done through a lot of research and through uh, you know a lot of sort of delving online and thinking about stuff and speaking to people. I've kind of sort of pinpointed certain moments in my life when I, I've realized. Now that, you know, one, I was suffering from depression, severe depression, and two, where it may have come from, you know, and mm. where, where, where I think it may have come from. Like, like obviously, this, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV either. But I, <laughs> I, uh, when I was three years old, uh, I, I grew up in Crocus Street, right? Just off of Falls Road, just off of, between the Falls Road and the Springfield Road in Belfast, right? And uh, right next to our street was a street called Violet Street, right? And I, for 40 years, Violet Street had an army barracks right in the center of the street. 
So the whole street was in darkness. Literally, they put a army barracks in the middle of the street. And our street was right next, was the, right, was the next street. So when I was three, uh, my mother, me and my mother were outside in the street. And she, she went and washing the car, talking to the neighbours. And a patrol came along the top of the street. And just as that happened, the IRA opened up with an M60 from the bottom of the street. And just more or less levelled half the street. Killed three three uh, British soldiers, uh, a couple of neighbours, and crippled the guy across the road from us. Now, when this kicked off, mother grabbed me, threw me through the door, and dragged me up to the kitchen to the back of the house. And she sat there crying for as long as I can remember. And all my life, I'd been able to see that and hear it. Like I can literally close my eyes and just see and hear it exactly as it was. And I was only three years old. So I've kind of come to the realisation now in, in later life when I've had to come through sort of depression that, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder was definitely a fact, a factor in me kind of growing up with a de- depression. Because up until I was seven, I would have seizures, you know, like just epileptic fits. And I didn't have epilepsy. I would just have these wild seizures, all based around the fact that I'd been through this sort of early childhood trauma. So my mother, who's a nurse, has been a nurse for over 30 years, she uh, took me to the Royal. She peeked down every door that was there. And she, tried, she got me assessed and... I mean, I remember having to go through, you know, those brain scans where they put the sort of gel on your head and cover your head and stuff. It was a weird experience. Mm. So I had all that done, and the doctor said to her at the time, you know, listen, this doesn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with him, but something's not right, and we just don't know what it is. So that was kind of the end of that, right? So I never really thought about that, and it kind of grew up in my life. But I think that, that made, me, it made me good at coping with things throughout my life, right, in terms of, like, in crisis, it's like I'm pretty good in a crisis. You know I mean, I don't lose my head, but throughout my life, especially when I got into like early teens, I would have these just, just crippling bouts of just crying, just a bit late at night, first thing in the morning, whatever. And if I ever got in any sort of verbal conf- confrontation with anybody, I would immediately start crying. I mean, like immediately, like you know, if I got in a school fight and somebody's pushing, I would start crying straight away. You know what I mean? <coughs> I couldn't control my emotions. You know, I'd be a very emotional and sensitive person growing up. And, you know, kind of, when I got to 16, 17, whatever, you know, I was in the 90s, and there was drink, and there was drugs, so a lot of that kind of, I kind of went through a lot of that, just, and life was good. And then I got involved in a relationship with a girl who, I stayed, I stayed with her for four years, right, my weight ballooned, I lost all my friends, right? I didn't go out anymore, the only person I went out with was her, and eventually I took my mother to actually break the relationship up, right, because I just didn't have the power to do it, I was just, I was just, I was just accepting my lot. And that was it. I would just think, well, this is my life. But I would still have these constant bouts of crying and just fear, just constant fear. And like, if I went to like a like on Halloween, like fireworks would scare the absolute shit out of me. I mean, if I was out in the street and someone was firing fireworks, I would be hiding behind the door in the house, just going, I can't go out there. I can't, I can't, I can't face that sort of, you know, massive sort of noises and people. And I got to this stage in my life where it was like, I don't know if anybody, if you've ever had this. But like, if I was going hang, I, I have this policy, not a policy, like, I like to hang out with different types of people. I think it's important for your life. I tell my kids that, hang out with everybody. But what I generally would start doing is, if I start hanging out with a group of people, I would just adapt their personalities. I don't mm. know if, if you've ever seen that Woody Allen movie, Zelig, but that's kind of what it's about. It's about a guy who just adapts personalities. And I became that guy for like most of my teens. I mean, if I was hanging out with a bunch of scumbags, I would affect scumbag behavior. If I was hanging out with musos, I would affect muso behavior. You know what I mean? Mm. Whatever, whatever it was. So I kind of really didn't have a personality or an identity. Kind of growing up. So, like, but I, I knew all this, but I never addressed it. I never spoke to anybody about it. I kept it all to myself. And I kind of, it, it generated this, I can do it all on my own attitude. That I kind of, that kept on going and going and going. Like, I mean, if I was going to go and do something, if I was going to, have, if I was going to write a song, I'd do it myself. If I was going to get a job, I'd do it myself. If I was going to do this, I'd do it myself. You know, because I, I, I wasn't good at asking people for things, right? Maybe that's because I was afraid I would, I would expose this sort of weakness or this flaw in my character, in my personality. So it kind of just kept going on. And it, it, became, it became normal living just to have this, every so often knowing that I would have this just crippling, <coughs> crippling fear. Just, just like, I mean, I remember one time uh, we, were, we were living in New York, myself and my, my wife and was my girlfriend at the time, and just... She was at work one day, and I just lay on the floor crying for about two hours for nothing, you know? Mm-hmm. Just crying, weeping uncontrollably. Now, certain, obviously, certain life experiences, I mean, like, would, like, everything would devastate me. 
everything, the smallest thing would just absolutely send me off the fucking edge, you know, and it, it kind of felt like I had this guy in the back of my head, it just wasn't on my side, regularly, constantly, just keeping me down, telling me shit was going to be shit, and you're not shit, and I, and I read in Paul McGrath's book that he kind of had the same sort of thing, just had somebody in his head going, you're, you're, you're just fucking garbage, you know what I mean, Dude. and I had that constantly, and it was coupled with these, just these bouts of just complete and utter t- terror that I didn't know where we were coming from. But my, my, my wife, Fiona, like she's been through depression, you know, not, not sustained periods like I have. So, I mean, and she would say to me for years, you know, why did you go into the doctor? You're depressed. And like, like I said before the start of this podcast, I was, I was so dismissive of, of, the, of actual depression that even suffering and knowing that I had all these things that I had to deal with, I still would dismiss it offhand and go, fuck, I'm not depressed. Bullshit, taking, taking tablets is for wankers. You know, when she tell me about her friends and everybody going, ah, fuck, I mean, I can't. So I developed this sort of stern, sort of steel, you know, opposition to admitting the fact that I had depression. Mm-hmm. When it wasn't until, I mean, we came back here uh, in 2003 when uh, Fiona became pregnant, we came back and lived with her father. And I came to a town where I didn't know anybody. I uh, had no friends. Fiona was pregnant. I got a job in one of these fucking, what would they call them? Cafe bars they used to have during the Celtic Tiger. It's full, mm-hmm. full, full of wankers drinking Cosmopolitans and doing coke. And I worked in there and I fucking hated it. And I just went down this, just down this hole of just doing the worst possible things in my life. Like I come, I come home at night and I just drink non-stop for the next morning. Just drink whiskey non-stop for the next morning watching TV. Taking drugs. Fucking up, fucking around with all the women even to a certain point. You know what I mean? Like so. And it got to a point where eventually my uh, my first daughter was Lucia was born. And uh, obviously that was a fantastic thing. But that lasted really briefly. And I went just back into this. Just this shit box of emotion. And like, for sort of, like for a good maybe four years, like, it definitely feels like my wife Fiona. She she just raised her on her own. Because I was at that point, I got a job in Sonopress Press where myself and Harper managed to meet. And I'd be coming home from night shifts at six, seven in the morning and just crack up a bottle of Jack Daniels and sitting there in front of the TV until I passed out. And then I'd wake up and I'd go back to work. And like if she said anything about it, I would just turn into this absolute fucking goblin. Just eat, eat, just eating people up with this just rage and nastiness and saying shit to people and she would and she would still say to me she'd say like you're depressed you know you need to go to the doctor you're depressed and eventually i got to a point where uh like our relationship was was just a bit was about to break down i mean like it was basically like the, uh, we, we can't keep doing this anymore this is not working um, we, we took some time away i went to wexford for uh, for like a weekend a long weekend and we chatted and it was a really emotional experience and i kind of felt i came away from it with a bit more uh sort of understanding of what I needed to do. So I went and seen a therapist. But of course, even even that decision became became a sort of, uh, I kind of had to hide things. I had to hide the therapist. So I picked a therapist mm-hmm. that was the furthest therapist away. I picked somebody way down in Dublin. So I had to travel an hour to go to them. And the first day that I went there, I couldn't find it and it was late. And I went fucking bananas in the car. I fucking, the guards stopped me. I drove over a fucking uh, divide in the road and everything, just complete anger fucking racing through traffic because I, I couldn't get there on time and we had to cancel the session and I was just going fucking out of my mind but eventually I did you know get to see him and I spent two years going to him and it was very expensive but it, it worked really well and it wasn't like I got to a point where he said to me okay you can go now I just stopped going I said I'll see how this goes and it went fine right and it was going really well and I was coping with things I was trying to keep a positive outlook but then I started coming back again you know I started getting these like moments of rage like if I was if we, if we were leaving the house, for instance, to go somewhere, say if we were going to go to the park, right? And to go to the park, we had to pack X amount of things. And if Fiona or one of the kids forgot one of the things, I would go fucking tonto and ruin the entire day, right? As in, like, to the point, like, I'd be fucking smashing my fist on the fucking dashboard. I'd be screaming and shouting. It'd be everybody's fault. I, I would just ruin everything. I was just this fucking cyclone of just... Just hatred and rage and anger, mm-hmm. and I couldn't stop it, you know. And I could see the detrimental effects it was having on my wife and my kids, right? And looking back now, I can pinpoint several moments. Where I think, like, why the fuck didn't I? Why didn't I realize at that point that I'd got that that had gotten that had gotten too far? Like, I mean, I remember going into town one time in, uh, in Dublin and going into the car park of Brown Thomas, 
and everybody was brown Thomas to build like a multi-story car park and I couldn't get a space so I went to the very top and I was with my daughter she was only a baby at the time and I remember standing at the edge of the brown Thomas car park for about 10 minutes just staring down just constantly thinking in my head going I'm going to do this I'm going to jump I'm going to go fuck it I didn't I don't know how I didn't but I didn't do it but that kept ha- I, that shit kept happening I kept having these dark thoughts right constantly thinking about like oh how can I do this? Or how can I end this? How can I can get rid of this? Get away from this? And the thing that kind of kind of broke me, not that broke me, but made me realize, you know what? I gotta go and talk to somebody about this, even if it's just the GP. I went to the uh, the Huns game, remember when Levy scored? Mm-hmm. Uh, when we went top of the league. And uh, I was remember being at the game, I was super excited to go. Gary McKeady got me a ticket, and Harper helped me sort it out. I was super excited to go over. But see, when I was there in the stadium, I was just numb. And even when, even when Ledley scored, right? Obviously, I was jumping around, going bananas. But it was, like you say, it was an act. I was there was nothing. There was nothing going on. Like, it was just nothing. Like that day, I got to Glasgow. I got off the bus, supporters bus. I didn't speak to anybody on the bus. Or only person I spoke to was Gary, and he was on the on on the ferry. And then I got off that bus and I walked all the way down Argyle Street, all the way down to the Marriott, and I sat there all day, drinking, until it was kickoff. I didn't go meet anybody. Didn't speak to anybody. And I, like, when I came back from that, I was like, right, I need to fucking, I need to do something about this. Because like, I was just turning into, I was turning into nobody. I mean, I had no spirit. I had nothing, had nothing about me. I had nothing going on. I mean, I just felt like I was fucking just wasting away. I mean, I, I wasn't playing any music. I couldn't even pick my guitar up. You know, I couldn't even think about it. I mean, I'd go to parties and people would say like, oh, yeah, play a song. And I'd have to go into the toilets and just weep until, until that, like this fear had gone. I mean... And mm-hmm. eventually, I went to the, the, the I went to the doctor and I spoke to him. And I literally said to him, "said it was a fucking match last week." I said, and uh, I could feel nothing. And it was one, it was one of the highlights of the year. And I felt nothing, even coming back from it. Like it was just, it may as well, it may as well had not have gone, you know, for for all the difference it made to me. And uh, he recommended uh, tablets. And this is the one thing that I had been for years been like, "Fuck, I'm not taking tablets." Whether that be, that's probably just a, a reaction of you know feeling weak, the fear of being weak, you know, that caused me mm-hmm. to just dismiss any kind of treatment whatsoever. So, uh, that happened, I spoke to him, and he got me on uh, antidepressants, a thing called Cipratan. Now, and through the course of this as well, I, I isolated myself from my family, from my extended family, I was like my, my, my parents, <coughs> and my sister, and my brother, uh, it caused great upset with things that said to people, like I'd fixate on one thing somebody had said at a party once, some sort of joke or gag about me. You know, meaning a bit of slagging, I'd fixate on that and I'd bring it back to that person and ask them to explain themselves like very, very angrily. So that's kind of a fact of like my, my, fa- my family relationships as well, you know. But once I got on the zipper tan, like obviously I was expect I, I wanted to just take it and just be no- things to be normal. And that's probably why I drank so much and took drugs as well because you just want to you just want to feel something else. Mm-hmm. Just to, you don't just want to you, you want to break, you need to be holiday. It's one of those things where, like, if I can fucking just get a wee break away from this, I can come back with a new, but and just you know deal with it again. But that's not what you do. What you have to do is just deal with it and cope with it and live with it and struggle with it. So I got on the zipper time and I spoke to my mother, and she said that that was a very, very good drug. And within four weeks, I felt like a brand new person. I actually, I felt like I just woken up from a horrendous dream, you know. And I said it to my wife, my, my, my man, and stuff, and I was like, I actually feel like. I feel like I've come out of some sort of coma where I haven't been in control of myself. And uh, I'm still on that. I've been on that now for a couple of years. But I have tried to go off it, right? And I've noticed that I've literally, like, I don't plumb it back down in the usual way, but I definitely, within three to four days, I can feel the hackles in the back of my neck rising. I can feel myself getting annoyed by very, very small things. I can feel that rage coming back. And, and I know I know now how dangerous that is. And I, I like, and to be honest with you, I think I'm fucking one of the luckiest guys in the world to still have a family to fucking turn to, given some of the shit that I've been, I've, I've, I've put them through, you know. And it's also something I think runs in my family. I think my father suffers from it, and my brother suffers from it. But you can't tell anybody how to deal with it either, you know. You mm. you can give advice, but you can't you can't you can't sort it out for them. It's something they have to realize. You have to accept it as a problem and as an issue, and you need to like take action because they're. That's the first step to, you know, making it easier on yourself, you know? 
And I suppose, mm-hmm. I suppose, like for a guy like me who for years be, I, I can't ask for help. I don't want to ask for help. And the one thing that was going to make things better for me was asking for help. And that's the one thing yeah. that I never did. And I'm trying to help myself. Once I got the help from them, <coughs> once I spoke to somebody and got the help from them, I knew then that I could help myself because I kind of had a, some sort of support network to help me out. I spoke to mm-hmm. one of my, I spoke to one of my closest friends, and I spoke. I, I said to him, "Listen, I've just kind of." Uh, realized I've suffered from depression all my life and he was stunned he was like you he's like I would never he said you're the one per- one person I would never have thought would suffer from depression and that kind of struck me as well going like well I must I must be fucking great at hiding this if nobody ever thought I had it but it's that same thing it's putting on that smile and putting on that you know just a- affecting behavior just so nobody knows and so you don't bother anybody that was always a big thing about me I didn't want to bother anybody with my problems I didn't want to be a burden on anybody else so I'll just take it all on myself you know, like, and for the sake of that, I mean, I went through some serious bullying when I was a kid. Actually bullied by one of my own friends, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a job in New York where the, the boss bullied me for two and a half years, right? And everybody could see it, but I just took it until 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 it got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore and I had to leave. But uh, all those things, were, I, I think, were a result of just me not being able to cope with what was going on inside me. So like the kind of the world just happened to me. Life just happened to me, and it's probably only until only the last two years that I've kind of come like got a, got a grip on myself. And it's like I mean, I, and when I did get a grip on myself, when I did kind of come out of this, I realized that my life was in a sh- was pretty fucked. You know what I mean? It wasn't in a great it wasn't in a great place. I wasn't in a great place as a family. We weren't in a great place financially. We were in a shitty place, and I can't, I'm not saying all that's down to depression, but I'm saying like. I realized that when I just decided to start coping with my depression and like, taking it seriously and taking it, being proactive about it, I realized all the other mistakes that I had made and I realized all the things that I had needed to fix. And that could have done one or two things. It could have sent me back down the hole or it could have motivated me. And it kind of motivated me. I got, it wasn't like a scene from Rocky. I didn't like, run out in the streets. and you know. But I, I tried doing different things. Like I tried, I mean, I, even, even when I ran the Dublin Marathon, Right, I trained for a year and a half to run the Dublin Marathon. I ran every day at May. Even that couldn't fix fix it. It made it slightly better, but I'd be running in the back of my head, the guy going, oh, "Just stab you, fat cunt." You know what I mean? And like it was tempted to stop in the middle of the rain and just be screaming at the fucking sea because I couldn't run anymore. You know, and so even that didn't work. So it came to the point when I re- I had to stand up and say, "Right, I have a problem. It's affecting everybody around me. It's affecting me." And I'm either going to end up dead or I'm going to end up fucking alone and estranged from everybody I give a shit about. And eventually when I did do it and I took the sip of time and I still take it. And to be true, it, it's changed my life. It's changed the way I look at my life. It's changed the way I, I speak to people. It's made me more comfortable socially. I mean, socially I wouldn't, I, I would, I would come across as being good, but, but a lot of it would just be regurgitating old, old shit just to kind of keep things, keep things, keep, keep the, you know things moving in, in the in the social circles or whatever you know, and but now I'm much better at that. I'm much I'm much more relaxed. You know, sure. now that I've now that I've, I've taken care of it. Well, as I said, I've taken care of it. Like every every day is a struggle. I mean, there is dark thoughts and there are bad things, and I do get knocked for six by certain certain things that happen. But I'm able I'm able to look at it objectively now and say, you know, this is I'm feeling like this because of this. So if I can mm-hmm. if I can take that out of the equation, what what should my logical response be to this problem as opposed to the, oh, fuck, you know what I mean? I'm just mm-hmm. screaming and shouting. So, you know, I I feel like I wasted an awful lot of time and I lost an awful lot of other people's time by by not addressing this. And I feel like I've ruined massive opportunities in my life because of the deal with it. I'll give you an example. When I was when I was living in New York and I had like a production deal going with it, with, a, with like sort of record producers, we toured all the record companies, and I remember, remember, everybody being very excited. We got invited into uh, Epic Records, which is like a, a brand of like a, a subsidiary of uh, Universal, I think. And uh, we went up to this office. This guy called Pete Gambarg, and Pete Gambarg is the guy who would have put together the Santana Supernatural album. He's the guy that found Run DMC, uh, Springsteen. This guy is fucking. He's it, like, and he had asked for me to come in and meet him. And I went in his office, something like eighteen floors up in, in Manhattan his office just covered fucking gold records platinum records and he wanted to hear me sit there and sing and literally I was told going to the door this could be the difference between the rest of your life and you going back to the bar and the only thing I could think about when I went into that room to talk to him 
oh, like the voice in the back of my head just amplified like I was coming through a speaker saying, you are fucking shit. This is not going to work. So I know for a fact, like, and, and it didn't work. I completely made an absolute fucking balls out of it. Right? I could have changed my life, but it didn't. So I know that I've ruined lots of things in my life because I didn't deal with this. And that's the one thing, that's, that's the, the fear of that that spurs me on to keep, keep it under control because I do desperately do not want to go back to having any of those problems. And I urge anybody out there, like, if you feel like that you're that you're, you know, you're making decisions in your life, or you're 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 affecting other people in your life, uh, in a way that you don't necessarily want to, or in a way that you know you can't, you, you feel you can't control. And I know I know people like that. You need to you need to go and talk to somebody, and you should go and talk, even if it's just talking to your mate or talking to anybody, just somebody who can who can give you a wee bit, alleviate a bit of the pressure in your brain. Mm-hmm. Do, you know, do you know what I think is an important thing as well, right? Um, my doctor explained this to me when when she put me on the, the medical. She says, because uh, she saw my face right away when she was talking about putting on this, and you've got to go on this for, she says, this isn't going to be something you've taken for a month, six months, you are probably taking this for a few years. And she saw my face right away. She says, look, she says, you need to get the, the stigma of taking drugs for anxiety and depression and that kind of thing out of your head because the pharmaceuticals have come on so far in the years like these things when people were addicted to tranquilizers now that was all that's all kind of well, obviously switched up people still do but it's come on leaps and bounds since then the side effects aren't the same as they used to be they're, they're controlled better and there's there's a more choice I want a better word that they can pinpoint things better, have certain drugs for certain things. Because often when I read, when I, when I was talking about things on Celtic Minded, often people, the first thing somebody will say is, but I definitely didn't want to be taking drugs. Mm. And I'm like, you, should, you shouldn't have a, I mean, I'm not saying that's an answer, but I'm saying you shouldn't just roll it up. No. You shouldn't the, the, You shouldn't have a automatic thing, well, that's something like, like this. It's going to lead to something else, or there's going to be a bad side effect to that. Things have come on. This is 2014. They're improving that kind of side of things all the time. Help is far, far better now because it's so commonplace. So, I mean, doctors are better able to deal with it. They're more understanding, for, for certainly the, the doctors I've seen here anyway. And don't have a fear. Of taking drugs. I'm not saying go to your doctor if you must I'm not saying go to your doctor and demand a pill, uh, the, 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 the drug Joe's mentioned or the, the drug I mentioned. Don't go to your doctor and demand that because you, because you're, you're, uh, you're relating to what we're saying or anyone else, and then you say, well, if that drug works for him, it works for me. But I'm not saying that either. I'm saying don't discount it. No. Because if, as Joe tell you, it's helped him. It's helped me. Now I, I, I'm, I'm weird in the way that I can. I take my, my pulse first thing in the morning, I take my diabetes pulse, I take my work and then off go work. And I have another set to take halfway through the way. Sometimes I forget to take them and it makes absolutely no difference to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But there'll be, I've, I've sat on the bus before going to work and I'm feeling great. Suddenly realised I forgot to put my pills in my back pocket and I go off the bus at the next stop. Mm. Knowing the fact that I probably didn't even need them, but the fact that I know, oh shit, I'm not going to, oh my God. Off the bus, next stop, waiting on the bus, come back, get them back on the next bus, back to work. So there's that side of it to me, it's like a sort of maybe a security blanket, yeah. if you like. But there's no sort of physical side effects to the fact that I don't take them a lot. Um, obviously, it's something that you have to wear yourself off eventually. Well, and I have my, my dose is a lot lower than what it used to be. And, and now, like my doctor says to me, I could probably take it to the fact that because they kind of work, they actually kind of work. It's like five minutes later, it can totally change my mood when I take one. So I'm actually like, you, you don't have to take two of them, or you just take it if you feel you need it. Yeah. Sort of thing like that. So what, 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 a long way, a long-winded way of saying, don't be scared of the, the fact that the doctors want to prescribe you something. But mate, get, ask, ask them, tell them, tell them, get this, get, find out all the side effects, what this is going to do to you. If it's going to change and we get all that information because they'll give you. Mm-hmm. And it is far, far better now than it used to be. It shouldn't have the same it shouldn't have the stigma that it has in my opinion. No. But I mean it's it's that, <coughs> it's that thing as well. I mean, like I I'm aware now that obviously uh, like a lot of experiences have affected the the levels and depths of depression I've gone to. 
but you know, we're now through, through using this drug that it's mainly chemical. And if something's, mm. if something's in your head and it's chemical, I mean, obviously, like going back to when I was a kid, but like the doctors telling my mom that something wasn't right, but they didn't know what it was. So, I, my kind of putting, putting those together, I think to myself, well, it must be a chemical thing. <coughs> if, I'm, if I'm taking that drug and knowing how it helps me and how it affects me, I do just kind of, it's kind of, obviously, it's a disease, but I kind of look at it now as if it's just like something I have to do every day, like, 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 yeah. like, like washing a cut, I mean, or, 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 or changing a plaster. It's just something that I have to do. To keep things going and uh it's just a, it's just a mental th- not a mental thing a, a, a chemical thing in my brain and to a certain degree that takes away a lot of the weakness and a lot of the stigma for me because we're like well it's just something that's out of my control and that's what people don't like need to need to understand is that it is something that's out of your control but it's only out of your control if you don't address it and if you don't speak about it because it will just take you on a fucking wild ride through your life and like you don't know what's going to happen and, and you will do things you never thought you could do you'll, you'll say things you never thought you could say you know what it'll affect everybody differently you'll go down you'll go up but if you if, if you realize that, that, that you, you don't control it it controls you then you realize you're, you're you're in a bit of a battle and you realize it, ha- it has to be you have to fight it and it is a fight like jason said before like linda was fighting it it is a fight you know and sure. it, 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 it takes everything you got mentally you know, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's literally, it's a process in the mind to, to, to get to a point where, where like it's, it doesn't go away. You just cope with it. And it kind of sits in it. You can put it in a certain part of your mind where you can, where you can leave it there, you know, and you can constantly, you know, just keep dealing with it, but on a lower level, you know, if that makes yeah. any sense. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're out there and you're listening and like, anybody you knows having trouble, please, please, please. Go and speak to somebody. We have uh, we have some links here actually. We can talk to people. There's a uh, there's a place called SAM. It's S A M H. If you're in Scotland, it's SAM. It's the Scottish Association for Mental Health. And if you're in Ireland, there's Aware, who are a, a company. Aware.ie you can go to, and you can also go to uh, www.sam.org.uk and Aware.ie. That's just the Scottish and the uh, and the uh, the Irish sort of companies that. that that, that deal with this but I mean if, if you have no access to any of those sort of services GP that's who I went to went to my GP Definitely. lovely guy and uh, very understanding you know and straight away give me a prescription told me what to do and off I went you know and uh, like I go back every couple of every six months for like a kind of I just not not check up. Just in fairness, I think he's just taking money out of me. So I just go down and <laughs> I just go down and talk to him. He says you're still happy. I go, yep. And he gives me the gives me the pills, and away I go. And I get like a six month prescription. And I, I kind of resign myself to the fact that I may be on these for life, and it doesn't bother me, you know, because you know I'm a lot happier. I'm a lot more confident. I mean, I wouldn't have been a very confident person growing up. I wouldn't have had a lot of self esteem. But I suppose I, as I've gotten older, that's become the things that I've done. That's become a bit better. But certainly taking that has has given me a lot of lot of confidence knowing that I've, I'm, I'm battling with something that, that has held me down for so long and uh, it's made everything better in my life, made my, made my work better, made my relationships better, uh, it's made my family better, uh, every, like, how I deal with you know losses and stuff, everything's become a bit better, I've become more of a rounded person because of it and uh, like, it's, like, I can say it's saved my life, you know. And as, as Paul said, like, if anybody there's many of us of therapists that can really go over their own life experiences, but mm-hmm. if anybody listens to this and they didn't have anybody to talk to, mm-hmm. they, they, they actually still don't feel they're ready to come out to, to somebody. If you always speak to anyone else, well, of course, it'll be completely confidential. Uh, if you want, homeboys at gmail.com, and I normally go all the emails, but if it's something like specific, what to ask Paul about, or Jason, or Joe, or I'll certainly forward it on to him mm-hmm. and, and listen. But, I think so. But, but, but this is it's a serious thing. I hope people take this podcast for, for what it's meant to be. Um, we're not we're not trying to be or we, we know it all, but just trying to share our experiences to, mm-hmm. to the hope that somebody sitting listening think is suffering the same things. Well, if they can come out and talk about it, well, so can I. Yeah. And. Uh, just urge anybody to just you need you need to seek help because it'll not get better and so yeah and one one important thing I think we've, we've no mentioned like obviously in a serious note people are really if you're in the depths of despair what you can take some comfort in the fact is that you don't support Sevco 
Keşke hmm. ya ben cem ederdim söyledim. Evet. <gülüyor> 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 it's interesting. It's interesting you say that. Just as well, because I mean the one thing. I mean, this is another thing about, especially about Celtic related. Like anywhere I've gone in the world, like, like I wouldn't be great at making friends just off the bat. Some people are great at going into pubs and just making friends and starting a group of friends. I was never good at that. So to have something like Celtic, especially when I went to America, to have something like Celtic to kind of integrate me into some sort of unit of people, you know, with 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 a positive feeling, it was always great for me. It was something I always treasured. It's yeah. always been a great companion to me, and it's something that's that's really because really, yeah. like, for all I know, but. Bar having like Celtic supporters clubs to maybe be able to go into and you know have you know something some common ground with people where we can share it and in a yeah. positive way it makes things it makes things that wee bit easier and you do get that wee break of it so supporting Celtic is definitely has been a plus for me you know totally agree my my brother in law has emigrated to America he's married an American girl he's not into football at all. and I know they've they've moved about a wee bit I think he finds it hard to like meet folk <laughs> but. The thing is, if I was there, you, you would have like 20, 20 drinking buddies at least anyway, because you would join the local Celtic supporters club. Aye. You know, and uh, even on Sunday there, when I went to watch a Dundee game in Manhattan, you know, you walked into Jack Dempsey's, and I already know a lot of the guys just through Celtic. You know, you can just crack up there and get a few beers. And So everybody listening to this is obviously going to be a Celtic supporter, or if you want to, if you feel someone would get benefit of listening to this, obviously share it with anybody. It's nothing to do with Celtic. Yeah. This it's a serious subject, but uh, uh, it's a good point, Joe. If you're a Celtic supporter, there is you can reach out and you've got about a common ground with people. But as you said, with, with the the main part of this is talk to somebody about it. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's it. the first step. You know, right. Talk to somebody, and if you talk to us, email us, Twitter, whatever we, whatever, whatever we Absolutely. want. Absolutely, anytime. Way. Just wake Harper up. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's that's, that's pretty much done. Like we've covered it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the the message is we're willing to talk about it. You should talk about it if if you're suffering it or anybody you know is suffering it. Uh, we just hope this can do some sort of good by you know talking about personal experiences because that's really all all we can go on because we don't really have a, a medical understanding. We just have a personal understanding and. Uh, other people out there who have uh, have suffered, even offend somebody who has suffered, or you know, the, the, everybody's a, there's a lot of help. Basically, is what I'm trying to say. There's a lot of people suffering this. There's a lot of because it, it, it is a silent killer, you know. So please talk to people. Uh, please seek help. And best of luck. Heal, heal. Cheers, guys. Heal, 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 heal. Heal. Cheers. Cheers.